everyone. Welcome to the MAPC webinar, Increasing Access Part 2, Expanding Access to Community Shared Solar in Your Community. I'm, I'm Cami Peterson. I'm our Director of Clean Energy here at MAPC, and we'll be kicking off our webinar now so that we can get going on introducing you guys to some really great um, speakers that we have lined up for today. And before I, I turn the, the mic over to them, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background into MAPC and the solar work that we've been doing. Um, so we'll start off there. So first off, just our agenda for today. As I mentioned, I'll give you a brief introduction, and then we'll turn the, the mic over to Isaac with Resonant Energy, then to Kelly at Solstice, and Philomena with the Department of Energy Resources. And we'll hope to save some time at the end for some questions and answers, and you guys can type that into the chat box, and at the end of the, the program, we'll, we'll turn it over to our speakers to answer some of those questions. Like I said, just first off, to kind of lay the foundation of who we are, um, for those of you out there who might not know, the MAPC is a regional planning agency. We serve the 101 cities and towns of Greater Boston. You can see on the map there all of our regions. We have over 80 employees now, a large staff for a, the public agency that serves our cities and towns in many different areas of expertise, from transportation and environmental planning, to economic development, housing, and clean energy, public health, at Homeland Security, so many, many different types of, of technical assistance and services that we can provide to our 101 cities and towns and often to those beyond. Um, hopefully there's some tuning in now from, from even outside our region and we'll have this archived after for, for it to be accessible to anyone throughout the Commonwealth or beyond. A little bit more about our clean energy department. We work generally in these three different types of program areas. So we do a lot of collective work among our communities, looking to bring them together to find economies of scale, knowledge sharing, cost and energy savings through ESCO procurements, working on solar together, LED streetlights, community electricity aggregation um, with a very green frame to it, as well as our hybrid conversion technology, our green fleets program, and working on energy resiliency and storage. We also work one-on-one -on -one with cities and towns, helping them to strategize, put together energy and climate baselines, do energy and climate planning, net zero planning, uh, programming, education, outreach, workshops, um, helping communities to really plug in to the opportunities that we have, but also that other regional, state, and federal partners may have. And the technical assistance that we provide can go beyond that, too, to kind of helping communities write grants, work on gas leaks in their, in their community to collaborate between their cities and towns and utilities to accelerate gas leak repair, state and local policy, permitting and zoning, and we help a number of communities on becoming green communities and then you know, in working to take advantage of many of the different programs and opportunities that come with being a green community. Lastly, I just wanted to point you all to some of the solar opportunities and resources that you can find on our website. Um, so we've put together in the past a guide to streamlining the solar PV permitting process and developing supportive zoning bylaws. So a big piece in reducing the solar soft costs is on working through the permitting and zoning um, challenges that communities face and making that something that's more standardized and streamlined. So a lot of information there. And we've built on that within the last year by taking part in the U.S. Department of Energy's SolSmart program. We're currently hosting a SolSmart fellow that is working with seven of our communities. And that's something that the U.S. DOE will be offering again in the coming year and something that we hope to host again. So if you're interested in, in our region and are not currently taking part in our SolSmart program, let us know if you'd be interested in, in doing that in the future. And that's where an advisor can work with you one-on-one -on -one to really improve those, those processes of streamlining the solar soft costs in your community and making implementing solar um, something easier for residents and developers and businesses in your community. So something we'd love to help you on. Uh, lastly, we have a solar survey up right now. We've sent out to some of you about this, so sorry if this is the third or fourth time you're seeing it, but we'd love to know how we can help you to take advantage of solar opportunities in your, in your communities um, in, the, in the coming days, weeks, months, and years ahead. So please take a minute. It will only take you a couple minutes to fill out that survey and let us know how we can work with you more on these issues. And stay tuned for many more upcoming opportunities that we can, we can touch on at later time. And now I'm going to turn it over to Isaac from Resonant Energy to give you information about their solar access program. Thanks, Isaac. And Meg's going to now give you access to, to the program. Wonderful. Um, Cami, thank you so much for the introduction and for having us on here. It's a great lineup and delighted to be speaking with you all here today. Um, 
to introduce myself, uh, my name is Isaac Baker. I'm the co-founder and president of uh, Resonant Energy, and we are a community-based project developer um, that's working to build coalitions to expand access to clean energy and to make 100% renewable possible for 100% of people. Um, this launch photo is from one of our uh, first campaigns uh, that we ran here in the, uh, in the city in the past year, and this was from an interfaith solar campaign where over the course of a few months we started a pilot and got together um, houses of worship across the city um, in Dorchester, which is where uh, Massachusetts, which is where we are based. Um, and this was the result where we got four projects up um, as, a, as a pilot, um, all through no money down financing um, with local community impact investors, and we're able to save the churches a bunch of money and to show them how we could start bringing money into more limited resource communities and make solar possible in places where it otherwise the market had not been serving them. Um, so this, this photo we like to share as um, some of the big successes out of that um, early campaign where that we actually got legislation into the state house um, for those familiar with the Massachusetts area, um, we have our local representative um, front and center there, and then he then sponsored a solar equity bill coming out of this uh, first campaign. Um, so we have, as an organization, we have our sights set on supporting coalitions around uh, low-income accessible solar that leads and drives forward policy in addition to putting projects on the ground as well. So to provide quickly, see if I can get this to move forward. There we are. Um, so quickly, just to, to summarize, um, we're located in Massachusetts um, and our focus is on expanding access to um, affordable solar in New York and New England. Um, right now we have active campaigns on Long Island, in New York City, in upstate New York, um, and across Massachusetts, many of which have Department of Energy um, support through the Solar in Your Community Challenge, which is a grant that is running with communities um, all across uh, the U.S. right now. Um, to dive into how we run our campaigns, um, in addition to working with folks um, at the uh, municipal level, our goal is to bring together a lot of the nonprofits and community organizations that are going to be a part of driving adoption. Um, so when we work in different communities, these are examples of all across the Boston area and Somerville, Cambridge, and uh, Codman Square here in Dorchester, how we bring together um, local nonprofits, neighborhood councils, um, houses of worship, and other partner organizations who help us spread the word and really grow these campaigns. And it ends up looking a lot like um, a solarized campaign when we have offerings for residents in low-income communities, and we are partnering with these, um, with these groups to help get the word out and to run these campaigns over a six to nine month period. Um, to dive into some of the challenges that we faced and really why we got started in this work, um, our team had come out of a background of doing more traditional solar development in both residential and small commercial sectors. And some of what we saw when we started to move to do our work in limited resource communities um, as solar, the cost of panels has come down fairly dramatically and it's starting to become much more accessible, but there are a few kind of financial aspects to solar that have been made it, made it very challenging for folks to um, take part in the clean energy economy. So um, first and foremost, we found um, was financing was a significant challenge. Um, both nonprofits and low-income households that can't benefit from solar's um, 30% investment tax credit um, really needed a third party financing or somebody to offer them a no money down solar approach. And we found that in all cases, um, financing was constrained by the fact that folks did not have access to an adequate credit score or adequate amount of capital in order to, be, uh, to get that investment from a third party. Um, we also have found that trust has been a really big issue so that building these coalitions has been a big part of trying to um, cross that barrier and really build a sense of trust in communities that we're working in, um, that solar is working and that it is in their best interest. Um, we've got some political barriers where right now we have a lot of interest 
that we're seeing um, in the states that we work in where government agencies really want to drive forward social equity through clean energy. Um, and despite having some sort of carve outs and policy mandates, um, because we haven't been able to cross the, uh, the financing barriers, particularly, we just haven't uh, made a lot of progress yet in the last few years. Because, um, and then to talk about physical limitations, whether it's an older nonprofit building or a single family owner occupied building, um, buildings that don't have new roofs are not being um, updated and invested in are harder for, um, for solar to work in. And to just really underscore and outline that point um, about what we've seen um, with solar is that uh, right now, whether you're doing um, community solar, or in our case, whether you're doing residential rooftop solar or a church rooftop, um, there are many, many companies that will serve you if you have a 700 credit score or higher, uh, in some cases a 680, and that's represented by um, the majority of the large um, solar providers to date. Um, and that leaves about 50% 50, 50 of the market of folks who actually own roofs um, out, out of the equation. And so our goal when we uh, designed our program was to make sure that we could address that credit barrier and make rooftop solar available to any organization and to any individual regardless of income or credit score. So this is the, this is the meat um, of the presentation that we have come up with. Um, so to share with folks if they're familiar with the more traditional um, Solar offering, uh, it typically works uh, where you have an investor, and they pay for 100% of um, a system that would go on a roof, and then they charge the host um, usually 85 or 90% of it back over 20 years. And that requires them sending a bill each year to the host um, in order to serve them. And the challenge has been that extending that long term contract to a low income household. Um, most investors have not been willing to do unless they have a very, very strong credit uh, score. And so with our model, what we've introduced um, has been, come from a lot of research around what investors are looking for when they want to bring money into communities and they need an organization that is going to be there to pay them over the life of that system who is credit worthy and who is very, very likely to be around 20, 20 years from now. Um, and so that is why we introduced um, an anchor organization. Um, and so when we say anchor, all we really mean is a large electric user in a given neighborhood. Um, so what we can, by way of example, we can say if there is a household here in Dorchester, um, we're actively talking with a lot of um, large electric users here in the city, which could be anything from the MBTA to um, various municipalities here in the city, um, all the way down to a uh, local private school um, or some other a manufacturing facility. Um, and so the offer, it, the financial offer to the hosts is very similar to what you would see through a power purchase agreement, which basically says, we will, uh, we want to rent your roof and in exchange, we're going to give you 15% of the output that comes off of the solar panels from your roof. And that will result for the average um, household in a net savings on their electric bill each year of anywhere from 15 to 30% on their electric bill. So they pay nothing at any time. They get 15% um, of the value that is produced on their roof each year. And then the other 85% um, we transfer through virtual net metering, which is the same process um, that we use for community solar, uh, we transfer that value over to the electric bill of an anchor. So let's picture that that's a, a local municipality is signed on and that's the, that's the local state house and that's their electric bill. Um, and then by then paying um, for that electricity back to the investor, we've moved the obligation um, to repay uh, the value of that electricity from the host or the low income household, um, or the host could be a small nonprofit um, or any, any number of other kinds of organizations to the anchor. 
And the anchor, by being a municipality or any one of these organizations, has a very strong likelihood of being able to uh, repay and show the investor that it's actually not risky to put those panels on a low-income rooftop or a nonprofit rooftop in their community. Um, and just to make it crystal clear, because it is sometimes challenging, um, I, I like to say that the uh, if the investor pays a uh, thousand dollars in the first year um, to put those panels up, and then each month there's a hundred dollars worth of electricity that gets produced by the panels. The host would receive 15 of those dollars. The anchor would receive 85 of those dollars in any given month, and then the anchor would then pay. $85 back to the investor. So the net financial impact on the anchor organization is zero. And uh, what they're doing is essentially extending the fact that they are a credit worthy longstanding institution in the community to enable solar to go up on rooftops all across the city um, uh, or all across their community in ways that it otherwise could not have. So Without, uh, without diving any more into that, that is one of our newest solutions and we're really excited to be partnering with all these communities across Massachusetts and New York. And uh, if you have any questions, this is my contact information, but would love to speak with you further. And now I'm going to um, hand this over to uh, Kelly uh, from Solstice. Um, hi, my name is Kelly Roach. I'm a senior program manager at Solstice for low to moderate income inclusion in community solar. I'm going to talk a little bit about our work uh, to increase that access through putting some uh, empirical information and data behind uh, some of these assumptions that um, are we're, we're hoping to to shake out about low to moderate income access in this market. So first, just to give a very brief overview of Solstice in order to set the scene, we were founded in 2014, a New England-based social enterprise, so have a, an office in Cambridge in Massachusetts, and I'm down in uh, the New York area as well. So those are the, the two states we are mainly operating in, but uh, are, are also interested in, in keeping tabs on the rest of the region. and nationwide where there are, are opportunities for favorable regulatory environments for community solar. So we were founded on the premise that up to 80% of Americans are locked out of the rooftop solar market for a number of the reasons uh, that, that Isaac mentioned and that I'll get into again on the next slide. But we see how this particularly and disproportionately affects low to moderate income households and also people who are renters. So households through the Solstice model can support clean energy through community solar at no upfront cost and save 10% or more annually on their utility bill. So we see it as both a way to make some environmental impact, uh, but also for folks to save money every month, which uh, seems to be very important that while some people are, are motivated purely by the environmental value of participating in solar, community solar, for the most part, uh, it's not feasible uh, if it's more expensive than than regular uh, dirty energy. So working on, on ways to make it both a fiscally and environmentally responsible choice for households. So I'll talk a little bit about how there is a disproportionate effect with, uh, with solar exclusion on low to moderate income households. We know that they face severely limited access to renewable energy. So George Washington University uh, did a study that while 49 million American households uh, earn more than $40,000 annually, which accounts for about 40% of homes in the United States, these people comprise less than 5% of solar installations nationwide. So we can see a, a significant divide there. And that at the same time, these households are bearing a disproportionate energy burden even as energy costs decline. So low-income households are paying on average three times as much for energy as their wealthier counterparts, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. We also see that low to moderate income people bear the brunt of the ill effects of climate change, which produces all sorts of disproportionate health impacts. And we see that there's a, a close correlation here 
with other social injustices like racial injustice as well. So for instance, race and income are very closely correlated with the proximity of one's home to a, a coal plant, according to an NAACP uh, investigation. And we also see much higher rates of respiratory illnesses like asthma in the Black and Latinx communities. And finally, we see how community solar is uniquely suited to serve low to moderate income Americans and is growing faster than ever. So up to half of solar deployment by 2020 will be from community solar, uh, which, is, which is a pretty, pretty incredible escalation. Uh, but despite this, we see the barriers to rooftop solar aside that community solar, while it should be able to help alleviate a lot of these issues and, and serve the low to moderate income population is, is still falling short of doing so. So I'll talk a little bit more about why that is, which Isaac has touched on as well in terms of the defining the problem in part by a credit score issue. So this is, you know, a bit of a bit of a four square illustration to show that Income is a is obviously a key dimension of this exclusion, but given the correlation between income and credit scores and the use of credit scores as a qualification for community solar by both developers who are basically asked to do so by financiers, uh, that credit becomes a, an important dimension as well. So we see that serving low to moderate income customers who also have lower credit or even high income customers with lower credit uh, is considered unbankable by most mainstream financiers. And that leads most of these product offerings with community solar to cater to the affluent and the credit worthy. So as Isaac mentioned, a, a 680 plus or often even higher 700 or 720 plus FICO requirement and also 20 year contract commitment with a stringent or sometimes no cancellation policy. And these dimensions are just not suitable for low or no credit or rental populations who are also often low to moderate income. So we see the ways in which there's sort of some intersectional dynamics between, uh, between these various issues around credit, around home ownership versus rental status and income. So Solstice is looking to address this issue with two, a two-part and very related mission about creating access and also growing the market. So on the latter front, we're looking to expand the solar pie and help grow the market of customers. We certainly want to get to those projections of from from NREL about the half of community solar, half of solar deployment that will be community solar by 2020. And in order to do that, it will be essential to serve customers who comprise at least 50%, if not more, of, of the market who are currently excluded. And so that second part of that mission is to help those who stand to benefit the most from access to lower cost and clean energy to do so. So I'll talk a little bit more about the, the exact contours of, of this credit exclusion issue. So first to define a couple of terms, there's credit invisibility, and we see that approximately 26 million Americans are credit invisible, who are consumers without credit records with nationwide credit reporting agencies. Uh, people who, who have an open credit cards, who don't have a mortgage and the like, often are operating in a cash economy, et cetera. And certainly a lot of, we see younger people uh, as well as, as attitudes around uh, credit shift. Moreover, we see approximately 19.4, almost 20 million Americans who are have credit records that cannot be scored. And so this basically means that consumers do have some sort of credit file, but it's considered unscorable, meaning that it either has insufficient credit history to generate a credit score, um, too few transactions or, or uh, lines of credit, or that it's become stale and that it contains no recently reported activity. So about five years or so appears to be the window that, that most national credit reported agencies are, are using before uh, information is no longer considered relevant to be included or to generate a credit score. So this leads to almost 30% of all consumers in low income neighborhoods being credit invisible and an additional 15% having unscored records. 
So approximately 5 million low-income customers are credit invisible or have unscored records. And uh, we'll compare that to in upper income neighborhoods, only about 4% of adults uh, who are credit invisible or 5% who are unscored. And we see in addition to that, these disproportionate racial impacts, as I mentioned, there's a strong relationship between income, race, and having uh, an unscored credit record, according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's investigation. So in this context, by depending on FICO, the solar market is clearly limiting itself and excluding potential customers. And Solstice hypothesizes that FICO is in, in fact in, an imperfect proxy for qualifying solar customers and that those with lower credit scores or without credit scores altogether may still be excellent customers who pay their utility bills regularly and don't actually represent the sort of financial risk that their current scores or, or just lack of scores implies. And we see that through conversations about this hypothesis that the, the way to shift market assumptions here is to prove or disprove it through data analysis. Which brings me to the opportunity we're currently pursuing through the Department of Energy. Uh, SEEDS 2 is the name of the grant opportunity, the Solar Energy Evolution and Diffusion Studies. And effectively, it's an opportunity to scale low to moderate income inclusion in community solar by creating an alternative qualifying metric to FICO. And the award was, was granted to us in, in beginning in January of 2017. And we're working with academics at MIT and Stanford University to help do this data analysis uh, and, and to do some pilot projects, as I'll discuss as well, through a three-year funding opportunity. So the project gathers customer data to assess the assumption that metrics other than FICO should be used to qualify customers, and in particular, looking at utility, rent, and cell phone payment histories, which we think will be uh, logically a more accurate and inclusive proxy uh, versus FICO because it's a, a basically a relatively um, small to moderate monthly payment versus some of these other factors that are included in FICO scores that are not necessarily relevant to being able to make one's energy payments. So we'll be able to test the model by actually out of creating this alternative energy score, qualifying individuals and, and enrolling them in pilot community solar projects and being able to track their participation, compare actual payment to what was expected, see if there are higher rates of, of churn uh, or, or people staying in the project, and effectively identifying and testing better ways to finance and perform due diligence on solar purchases for these quote unquote non-traditional adopters. Just very quickly, a bit of a, an overview here of this data back solution. We're in the phase right now of, of analyzing this existing data and identifying trends in our target demographic of low to moderate income customers, then constructing this alternative qualifying metric, the energy score, which will be complete by the end of the third quarter. And finally, being able to execute these pilot projects where we would help to collect data um, through, through projects we can execute with local partners. And certainly if that's something that you would be interested in being a part of, would love to hear from you. Uh, my, my information will be at the end of this and, and during the Q&A. I know uh, Meg and Cami will have it up as well. And the very final piece is financing this product innovation. As Isaac mentioned as well and, and talked about at some length, the, the issue of contract length is very important. And so we see these pilot projects as an opportunity to help pilot consumer friendly and protectionist contracts and product offerings that are shorter term in nature and that don't have hefty cancellation policies or, or, or are very, very difficult to get out of. Uh, and we see this as, as a way, as I mentioned, to serve this low to moderate income renter market since renters are, are very unlikely to be able to commit to staying in the same utility zone, for instance, for, for 20 years. Uh, and we also think that the short term contract fits very well with the idea of reducing or, or altering the credit requirement since there may be less of a concern amongst financiers about uh, individual creditworthiness uh, having these super super prime FICO scores 
uh, when we're only talking about a commitment of a couple years versus you know, several decades. And finally, this idea of a direct credit support that could help us to uh, to get some of these pilot projects off the ground, that there is certainly some, some risk aversion and I think a misperception of risk about uh, whether, whether or not these customers will default. Uh, and we see that it may be possible to address that sort of bankability by guaranteeing performance. So through a, a governmental entity or a, a CDFI or another institution to be able to effectively backstop uh, the difference between what the the perceived revenue would be for, or the known revenue rather, would be for the the kind of standard quote unquote community solar projects we're seeing right now, with these 20 year commitments uh, and and super prime FICO requirements, and between the the assumptions that we're making here about what the the revenues would look like for these projects that include these non traditional customers. Um, and the idea being that you only have to draw down on those those funds on that sort of loan loss if um, if there if there is a significant difference there, um, but hope it will it will be adequate to convince uh, people who are not necessarily um, as keen to participate or, or certainly see a different perception of risk than we do uh, to to do so. And uh, Solstice can reduce the administrative burden on that side through conducting customer outreach, maintaining a wait list, doing all of the subscription maintenance and management and customer service, which is uh, part, of, part of what we do in, in the rest of our work. And we see this model as very sustainable, scalable, and replicable since it provides the opportunity um, to, to basically collect some forward-looking data through these pilot projects to indicate uh, what the actual customer default rates and churn rates are rather than operating on, on perceptions of risk that um, are, are unproven and it may in fact be inaccurate and be preventing the market from, from scaling and being inclusive. So I will stop there um, and certainly welcome questions and, and follow-ups. My address is kelly at solstice.us and I uh, know we'll have some time for, for questions and answers here as well. So I will turn it back to Meg and Cami to uh, shift it over. Great, thanks Kelly. Uh, Philomena, I'll pass it over to you now, hopefully smoothly. I think I have control, all right. Um, so I am Philomena Falcucci, I'm a program coordinator uh, for the Renewables Division of Department of Energy Resource here in Massachusetts. And I work namely on um, programs that put our state ACP funds back into, um, into play to promote renewable technologies. Um, so I'm not so much on the policy side, even though I will be going into a little bit of our SMART, our new proposed SMART program, and um, how it will impact the Affordable Access to Clean and Efficient Energy Initiative that I have been a participant in. Um, so. We have the ACE initiative that was put into um, action in February 2016. Governor Baker recognized that he wanted to uh, start an initiative to do just as both Kelly and Isaac said and in, in kind of space, uh, turn our attention to the low income um, community and having them have an opportunity to take advantage of some of these clean energy offerings the state was seeing, has been seeing a boom in. And in April 2017, we um, released our final report, as well as uh, announced $15 million of programs that are um, put in place to support the goals and the recommendations that came out of that report. Um, in order to get to the, the report, we did ha convene a working group. There were members that were from state agencies, public and quasi-public state organizations, as well as private stakeholders. Um, we it was highly active, 30 members. We met between April and, and August, and um, we got together, got these 32 recommendations, and put them into a report form. Um, this was partnered with DHCD, which is our housing uh, agency, as well as MassEC was a big player in, in a lot of what we'll, what we'll see as these programs that um, got released in April. Um, so the recommendations we broke down in our report into three main areas. 
um, to maximize clean energy opportunities at key times. So this deals more with the financing portion of clean energy adoption and that um, the group had, had thought that perhaps if we could find a good opportunity, whether it be the sale of a home or if you're the new buyer of a home, to introduce some clean energy opportunities into financing, um, almost making a financing package, perhaps that would be a way to overcome some barriers. Um, as well, area two, support and strengthen clean energy market growth and demand. Um, and this ha deals with the homeowner community and the developer community. Um, so education, messaging, uh, just overall making it a point to have those groups, the developer and homeowners, um, to fully understand the opportunities and to fully understand their options. Um, and then area three was the target and structure, to target and structure clean energy programs and incentives to better serve low income and moderate income residents. And this is where I'll get into our SMART program and how low moderate income, um, the low moderate income population has been taken into consideration, um, which it has under SREC 2 as well, but let's look towards our permanent or a more permanent future, which would be the SMART program. Um, so uh, in April, when the $15 million was announced, there were these three programs that already had um, been underway. We have the Renewable Thermal for Homes on Fuel Assistance. Um, this is run out of our department, and it is to put air source heat pumps and um, wood stoves as a secondary source of heat in, in homes of those uh, already taking advantage of LIHEAP. Uh, then we have the Low Income Clean Energy Challenge, which is out of Mass CEC, the Clean Energy Center, and it's $2 million. They have selected already the four grantees, and um, those are going for programmatic and scalability slash repl replicability for the future um, to promote energy audits, whole home solutions, um, optimizations, soft cost reductions, things along those lines more all-encompassing, and then we have the clean heating and cooling rebate adders, which also is uh, given out through Mass CEC uh, on top of the rebates that they already offer, and um, they are being fairly successful in comparison to the rebates that they get for non-low, moderate income qualified um, consumers. But that leaves $10 million of more programs that we did release in April and have um, begun the procurement process for. And um, this first one here is a, an agreement between DOER and DHCD where they have received $1.5 million to tackle some of their um, energy needs, clean energy needs in state-owned housing, state-supported housing. And um, one of the major projects of, that they're gonna be um, taking under is a geothermal system, which is pretty exciting because not too many of those um, have have been taken, have been begun at the state level in general, never mind for the low income population. Um, and that will also include a revolving fund because of our APS that will be released soon, which would uh, qualify that project to collect ACHES. Um, but that revolving fund could then go back into DHCD being, having the opportunity to have not only the 1.5 million, but the additional ache funding to um, further install more clean energy technologies. And then we have the ACRE program, Affordable Clean Residential Energy. This is a combination of CEC and DOER with CEC being the lead. Um, and we are currently in the procuring process for giving out $3 million for um, replicable models to combine air source heat pump and solar PV on um, low moderate income households. Uh, this is typically or most likely going to be aimed towards the low moderate income homeowner versus the renter, which a renter is kind of its own problem or its own barrier that um, would need to be solved in order to fully tackle the issue of low moderate income access to clean energy. Um, and then as Cami had referenced before, we have the ARC grant, which is affordable access to regional coordination. And we have $800,000 set aside to help um, municipalities and cap agencies and uh, no, not cap agencies, I'm sorry, the RPAs to better engage the low moderate income communities and to better staff and better be prepared to support the low income um, constituents in their desire and their opportunities to get clean energy and to um, 
more efficiently renovate their homes, energy efficiency-wise, at the very least. Um, and then we have a million dollars for zero energy manufactured homes. So this is um, intended to replace and either to replace mobile homes with manufactured homes that are net zero net energy and or to find um, opportunities where developments would be would be made no matter and instead of going ahead and doing traditional um, housing development you would do these zero net uh, energy manufactured homes which would um, then provide to the consumer zero utility bills in, in an ideal circumstance and then we also have that would that one is out of DOER. Um, and then we have a whole building opportunity funding, which is also out of DOER, our energy, efficient, our energy efficiency division. And um, they are currently, just have, have currently only released an RFI, and that is um, looking to develop that program for a whole building solutions. So again, focusing more on the developer side versus the, the single homeowner. Um, and then for interest of this group, the Community Shared Solar Demonstration Project, which is um, unfortunately has not been released yet, but that is due to the fact that we're waiting for our SMART um, tariff to be finalized. So our intention is to, or we have reserved $300,000 uh, for a pilot project to demonstrate new solar a new, the new solar incentive, our SMART program, and how it can um, properly give access to low-income rental community uh, to the benefits of solar. Um, so. Given our time lag on SMART and the release of this in April, we have not necessarily gone into detail in, in, in crafting this community shared solar procurement or the, the PON, RFP, however it may roll out. Um, but I figure um, a quick brief overview of where SMART stands today with our emergency regs filed um, earlier this month, I think that um, it could give the people on this webinar a good idea as to, you know, potentially where they could take that pilot project in the future. Um, so timeline of where SMART has been so far, in September of 20, uh, September 2016, a straw proposal was released. It was um, drastically different than SREC 2, so there has been, uh, understandably, a lot of conversation that has happened, a lot of many groups that were um, brought together and led by Caitlin Kelly as well as Mike Judge, the Director of Renewables over here at DOER. And um, we came together in June, well, they got it together by June 5th. They had the emergency rights filed. We are currently in comment period, so I do, I do um, recommend everyone go down to the um, email address below, doer.smart at state.ma.us to submit any comments that they do wish to have addressed. And then July 10th, in both Westfield and Worcester, there'll be two meetings. And July 11th, we'll have our Boston public hearing. Um, so if you would like to hear more or would like to get your, pub, your comment out in the public um, or you know have something addressed in front of Mike or Caitlin or perhaps just to meet them, you're welcome to join. And um, the dates and exact location are on the website. Uh, and then also July 11th is the end of comment period. So um, definitely give those, uh, the regulations a, a, a read through if it's of particular interest to you and your organization. Um, so here is in general what is being proposed or what has been filed. The tariff price is going to be established after a competitive procurement process. So anything that is between one to two megawatts, this price ceiling will be 15 cents per kilowatt and anything um, that is above the two megawatts, the price ceiling will be 14 cents per kilowatt. And then from there, once those competitive procurements have um, finished, we will, um, you can then see where your pricing will actually, actually be um, based at. So low income solar tariff generation with units less than 25 kilowatts, so that would be, um, you know, probably ones that are just on individual homes, 230%. And then if you have um, anything that's gonna be greatly larger, you can see there it goes 200, 150, 125. I'm assuming if we're doing this community shared solar, depending on how large they are and how it's all situated, you might fall into the 230 or you may um, 
go to the 150. So there's things to consider when planning a project. Um, and then there's adders to go on top of that. So this is where low income was really given the consideration for the purposes of um, the community shared solar project. You would likely fall into the category of having a six cent adder on top of the base rate. Um, now there's no opportunity to combine adders. You are strictly into whichever category best suits you. So um, while you might be a public entity and you're hosting this site and it's getting fed to more than 50% low income community share, you're not going to be able to have the two cents as well as the six cents, um, as well as um, you know the five cents and the three cents, all of the above. You, you would get the highest of the adders that you do qualify for. Um, and when it comes to being a low income qualified project, it is 50% needs to be off taken by a low income, uh, a low income customer. And yeah, so that is pretty much a basic overview of our SMART and how it would um, be able to be taken advantage or, or be able to be leveraged for a low income community shared solar project but these links here um, do give you a lot more detail and probably would um, might lead to more questions, which you're, I, I, I welcome you to email me or give me a phone call, and I can at least direct you in the right direction, whether it be policy-based or what, related to one of the programs. Um, but um, pretty much, it's pretty well defined in these, so Caitlin did a great job. If you go to the very bottom link, it would be the best guidance document for anyone here to to give a, a definite, I would suggest, a, a look over before that July 11th deadline. Great. Thank you, Philomena. Um, so we'll transition over to the Q&A now with everybody um, who's presented. Uh, we have a couple minutes remaining. Um, so if you have any questions that have come up, type them into the Q&A box, um, and we'll try to get to them in the next five minutes. Um, and if we don't get to your questions, um, we'll send them around to the presenters to connect you with some answers um, after the webinar. Um, Isaac, I know a couple of questions came into the Q&A specifically about the uh, solar access model, um, and you uh, kindly responded to the chat box. But do you mind speaking a little bit in response to them? They were about um, clarifying who exactly is the anchor entity um, in the solar access model, and then um, asking about what type of um, income screening uh, for low income are you currently using or, or looking into? Yeah, um, happy to happy to dive into that. So um, to to some of the the points that have been noted here, I think broadly speaking, to split the work that um, Solstice and that that um, Kelly's doing and what Resonance doing, we're working to serve low and moderate income households, and then I would say low and moderate income organizations, which are a lot of small businesses and nonprofits and various folks who own rooftops who really don't have access to financing right now, um, but that it is a, it's an owner-occupied model, so it is not serving a renter population directly unless a landlord is interested in sharing some of the benefit with their um, tenants, um, which is a whole separate conversation. Um, so to say um, in Boston, our experience has been that um, low-income owner-occupied buildings are most um, typically occupied by uh, retirees um, or folks who are later, later in life, um, but that still runs the gamut. Um, and in our model, the hosts are, in fact, the, um, the low-income individual household. So a, an individual project in one of our campaigns could be as small as you know, four kilowatts, 10 panels on an individual roof. Um, and then we have a lot of um, community centers or various small commercial buildings that might be 25 kilowatts up to 75 panels on a nonprofit roof or on a church um, as some examples um, of what that model looks like on the ground. Um, and then those hosts then get access to solar on the roof. They don't get any new bill and they just um, save um, a few hundred up to a few thousand dollars a year, depending on how big their array is. Um, 
As for how we do income qualification, um, I'm sure Kelly can speak to the challenges around that. We are in um, right now, basically, um, what most what we have already in Massachusetts is we have an R2 rate class. Um, so electric, all electric users um, who do go through the income verification process, if they're below 60% of median income, area median income, then they can qualify for the R2 rate class, meaning that under all of the DOER regulations we just heard about, they would then qualify for low income by that 60% R2 definition. Um, I'll say that it's my goal and what we're providing comments on is to expand that definition um, as right now we have a huge number of residents who haven't, even if they do income qualify, haven't gone through the process to get qualified for the R2 rate class. Um, and so income qualification is broadly a challenge, but right now it's mainly seen that either we can use the R2 rate class as a qualifying metric um, or we can, we're working with both in New York, NYSERDA, and in Massachusetts, the Clean Energy Center, to think about how we can work with private vendors and try and streamline an income verification process um, to do this work. Um, but that, that part is still evolving and is always a challenge in delivering these programs and adding a lot of hoops to jump through in order to get into them when it's hard enough to do, just get folks interested to begin with. Yeah, and I can just very quickly add to that, but I think part of the, the energy score approach we're pursuing as well is that we know there's a high correlation between poor or below super prime credit and uh, and lower to moderate income. And so uh, qualifying folks through an energy score formula uh, helps get around the issue of, of necessarily needing to do some of these income qualifications. So. You know, certainly, we want to be sure that we're we're serving the population that we we intend to. Um, so, in the in the data phase or the initial phases, of course, we would we would want to be careful about testing that and using some of these exactly some of these existing um, programs and and definitions, as Isaac says. And and the final piece I would add to that is one thing we're advocating for because of the difficulty of income qualification is using def definitions like. Um, environmental justice community, which Massachusetts has defined under law, um, which is more broad-based and qualifies um, like zip codes um, rather than individuals. So it would be a broader-based qualification, but if we had incentives tied to, you know, census tracts and things like that, that qualified communities more broadly for incentives like these, it would make rolling out programs a lot simpler. So that's something we're advocating for and looking into. Wonderful. Thank you guys for those insights and, and the, the response to those questions. At this moment, we don't have any further questions and we are up against the one o'clock deadline. So I want to thank all of our presenters and all of those who tuned in today. You'll see on this last slide how we will make the presentation slides and recording available shortly after the webinar today. So be on the lookout for that and please feel free to disseminate it widely. This is a conversation that's a part of a series of webinars and resources that we've been putting together on solar in general, but also an equitable access to solar and particularly through community shared solar as, as a model that's especially well suited for that. So we really appreciate feedback from all three presenters today and all of you who tuned in and asked questions and we look forward to continuing this conversation. So please do look out for those resources. Let us know if you have any further ways that you'd like to follow up with us or our presenters, and we look forward to talking more about all of this soon. Thank you again to everyone who presented and attended today.